Well, good morning, Kara City. It is awesome to be back with you. I always still say um, we've been in Connecticut about a year and a half, and whenever I'm coming, I say I'm going home. This is still home to me. It will forever be my home, and so it is always good to be back with my family and my church family in particular. So, yes, I did move to Connecticut, and yes, it is not 100 degrees up there. It is really, really beautiful up there. And um, one of the things that I love is we have all these trails, and I just love being outside. And there are some of the most beautiful trees that I've ever seen. I've taken more pictures of trees since we've been up there than I've taken in my whole life. And today, as we walk through the last words of Paul in the letter to the Ephesians, I just... The image of a tree just was in my mind, and I just love them, and I'm fascinated by them. And I think part of it is that there are trees all over the Bible from the first page to the last page. They are an image of strength and faithfulness, and God uses the image of a tree to represent his chosen people. In Jeremiah 11:16, in the message paraphrase, it says, a mighty oak tree majestic and glorious. That's how I once described you. And in Isaiah 61, the Lord says that redeemed, healed people, do I have some redeemed, healed people in the room today? Redeemed and healed on the stage with you right now. Redeemed, healed people in Isaiah will be called oaks of righteousness. It's a beautiful metaphor. Here is an image, it's going to come up on the screens, of one of the oldest oak trees in New Orleans. That's where I grew up. This oak tree is almost a thousand years old. That is amazing to me. Think of what that tree has endured, and it's still standing in the letter to the Ephesians, for the first six and a half chapters, Paul has given us the blueprint for building a thriving, strong, healthy community, a massive oak tree of strength and faithfulness that is, in Paul's words, rooted and established in love. The last five weeks of this series have been filled with the good news of who we are in Christ, the full scope of what Jesus has accomplished through his death and resurrection. When we surrender our lives to Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are transformed into the image of Christ. And every relationship is redefined by this new reality. Paul tells us to put off the old self, the one that is corrupted by sin and death, and to put on the new self, the one created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Everyone who puts their faith in Christ is a part of this new family. I love Again, how the message paraphrase puts Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. You were all called to travel on the same road and in the same direction. So stay together, both outwardly and inwardly. You have one master, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who rules over all, works through all, and is present in all. Everything you are and think and do is permeated with oneness. The Big C Church the global community of believers around the world are one family. It is a beautiful picture. And Paul implores us to love one another, 
to bear with one another, to sacrifice for one another, to humbly submit to one another. And we, we all nod in agreement. Yes, Paul, that sounds marvelous. For the first 140 verses of this letter, Paul makes sure that we know who we are in Christ and how we are to live in peace and unity together. Paul has shown you these last five weeks the ideal. This is the kingdom of God that we are to live out here on earth. And he uses those words like humility, submission, forgiveness, unity, sacrifice, peace. This is the high calling of the church and of every believer to be so confident in our salvation in Jesus, so rooted in love and faithfulness that we can confidently show the world by our unity and love for one another that God is real. The church is to stand tall and strong together like that mighty oak tree. So how do you think we're doing? When the world looks at the church, what do they see? Is the body of Christ united and loving one another? Are we humble? Are we sacrificial? Are we bearing with one another in love? Do we treat each other with dignity and respect? And how do we treat people outside the family, those who don't know Jesus? Do we act like people who have eternal hope and are unafraid? When I look around, I know something's wrong, and I don't think I'm the only one who thinks so. Why is the ideal so hard to achieve? If you would, you can turn to your Bibles or your Bible apps, Ephesians chapter 6 where we're going to find Paul's final words to the Ephesians, starting in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This unity, this peace, this beautiful ideal, Paul's saying right here, it's under attack by a very real enemy. And if we're going to grow strong in that strong, holy community that Jesus has called us to, we need to know who the enemy is and how that enemy fights. And then what in the world we're supposed to do about it. When I was in seminary, one of my professors always encouraged us to look up the word you in the passages that we were studying to see if the you was singular or plural, because in English it's the same word, but in Greek it's two different words. Through this entire passage of scripture that we're going to study today, Paul is using the plural you, as in you all, or as we Texans like to say, all y'all. For most of my life when I would read this passage, I would imagine myself putting on this armor and fighting this fight against the enemy alone my own private war. But we don't stand alone. This passage is a call to the church, all of us together, to put on our armor. We put on our armor and we stand against the enemy as one. So I want you to make that shift today in your mind as well. As we walk through these final words of Paul, Keep everyone in mind that's sitting around you, your family, Kara City Church, within the bigger family, the global church. We are called to unity in the struggle. 
Now, I've had a lot of different jobs in my life, but the one I went to college for was to be a teacher. I have a BA in history with a secondary teaching certificate. I am a proud Houston Cougar graduate. I love history. Some of my favorite classes centered around all the major wars. I did my senior thesis on German resistance during World War II. I've read countless books on World War II and Vietnam in particular. There's just something really fascinating to me about learning about war. The great military success stories have some things in common, not least of which is a thorough knowledge of the enemy paired with superior tactics and weaponry. The Vietnam War proved to be uniquely challenging for the US, even though we had superior weapons and resources. Our troops came home discouraged, the US public was divided and angry about the whole conflict, and ultimately, we were not victorious. One of the major problems for many of our troops during the Vietnam War was knowing who exactly the enemy was. This caused great stress for our troops. It was not always clear who was for us and who was against us. And if Christians are going to protect this unity that God has called us to, we have to be very clear about who the enemy is. And Paul tells us straight up in verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Look at those words, power, authority, evil, force. This is a strong enemy. This is a powerful enemy. This is an enemy that we cannot see with our eyes. Our enemy is not flesh and blood. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are called to love flesh and blood people. All people, including your flesh and blood enemies. Because Jesus knows and wants us to know that people, they are not the real enemy. Now, I don't mean to suggest that people are not capable of evil and harm and that people don't do horrible things. But I do want to suggest that there is something more behind it. There's something much bigger and much more powerful than many of us want to admit. Jesus wants us to love our enemies here on earth, the people we can see with our eyes, because it is that kind of sacrificial love that disarms the enemy we cannot see. And I think a lot of Christians have forgotten this. I'm guilty of this. It is easy to see wrong in the world and get angry at people. And I don't know about you, but I like to be right. And when we, in our rightness, condemn and judge and argue and post and tweet hateful words about people, we are feeding the enemy, not defeating the enemy. When we turn on people thinking they are the enemy, we close doors to relationships. We close doors to conversations. We lose our credibility and our power to be witnesses to the love of Christ. We become an instrument of the real enemy to keep people in a constant state of distrust and dissension. Too many Christians have started to view people who don't know Jesus as the enemy. I want to say this loud and clear. People who don't know Jesus are not the enemy. And you and I, we were once them. Paul told us that in this very letter. We were all separated from God. We were all lost. It is by grace that we have been saved. Jesus was tender with sinners. Jesus was gracious with sinners. Jesus was kind to sinners. Jesus loved people into his kingdom. He knows who the real enemy is. 
And I think it's bad enough when we view lost people as enemies. But when I look around, too many of us have started to view other believers as the enemy. In the Old Testament, God leads the Israelites into the promised land, into the land flowing with milk and honey. And you don't have to read very far before the Israelites start fighting with each other. They literally turn on one another. And before long, the nation splits into rival kingdoms. The chosen people of God are at war with one another. They forgot who the real enemy was. And in losing sight of that, they ended up in captivity and bondage. And they were no longer a blessing to the world around them. And the church is doing the same thing. We have forgotten who the real enemy is. Do you know that right now, most of the major church denominations in the U.S. are arguing and splitting over a variety of issues? Christians are fighting over politics. Many churches are so preoccupied with power and influence that they're actually neglecting the poor and oppressed. And the world is watching once again, so none of us forget, other people are not the real enemy. The second thing we need to look at is how our enemy fights. Because to win a war, you got to know how they fight. During the Vietnam War, the North Vietnamese used guerrilla warfare. These were sneak attacks and methods which are often really hard to detect and defeat. And so this made fighting them extremely difficult and dangerous. Let's see how our enemy fights by looking at verse 11. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Our enemy fights through schemes. It's the Greek word methodia, and it means cunning, deceit, craft, trickery. And it also means to lie in wait. Our enemy fights with two primary methods, lies and accusations. And he's waiting for an opportunity. His name means liar or accuser. He lies about us. He lies to us. He lies about everyone around us. His first words in the Bible are, did God really say? He wants us to doubt God, and he wants us to doubt what God says about us. He sows dissension, discord, disagreement. Author and teacher who's recently passed away, Tim Keller, said, Satan doesn't control us with fang marks on the flesh, but with lies in the heart. When I drive around and see churches on every corner, but hear people, other believers, criticizing those other churches for how they worship or serve or who they welcome, I get a sick feeling in my gut that we have fallen for the same old lie. The lie that says we are the ones who are truly serving God. We worship the right way. We address sin the right way. We teach scripture the right way. That church over there, they're not doing it right. Can you believe they fill in the blank? At a previous church one morning, I was serving at the guest kiosk, and I had a member come over very enthusiastically to introduce me to a friend that she had invited to church. And then she leaned in and she whispered in my ear, I got her to come from, and she named another church in our area. I smiled politely, but I couldn't get that sick feeling out of my gut that underneath that comment was a lie. The lie that our church was somehow better than that other church. The lie that our way was the right and best way. And this lie is destroying our unity. And it's destroying our witness. 
The most powerful lie, I think, that we can believe about others or ourselves is that they or we are unloved by God. That is a lie. In this very letter, in Ephesians 3, Paul prays that we can grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God for us and also for everyone around us. Who do you think is beyond the love of God? Is it the abortionist? A politician? Those transgender people? Is it Muslims? The white supremacist? The Apostle Paul was a terrorist who was transformed by the love of Christ. Don't believe the lie. It is our enemy's primary tactic. So we know who the enemy is, and it's not flesh and blood people. We know that he fights with lies and accusations. So now what? Do we get to pick up our weapons and fight back? Is it time to arm ourselves? What are we to do? Let's read the whole thing, starting in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Notice first that we are strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. This is not my strength. This is the Lord's strength. And we aren't putting on our armor. We're putting on God's armor. And we are to put on the full armor of God, all of it. We don't get to pick and choose which pieces we wear. And when you look at the list the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, your feet fitted with the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is God's armor and each piece is only possible through Jesus. Jesus is the truth. He is our righteousness. He is the prince of peace. He is the substance of our faith. He secured our salvation, and he is the word. We clothe ourselves with Christ. We put on Jesus. That's the armor every day. We put on this armor not so that we can go fight, but so that we can stand. Four times Paul says it, so that you can take your stand against, and you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand and stand firm, the purpose of the armor is so that we can stand like the mighty oak tree, the body of Christ, 
stands strong, united, and faithful. And then Paul says, we pray. We put on our armor and we pray at all times, in all circumstances. We don't have to fight because Jesus already defeated the enemy. When I think about our enemy, I always think of a drowning person. When you've seen a person that's drowning, they are flailing and kicking and grabbing everything they can to stay afloat. Our enemy is flailing because he's drowning. Yes, he's powerful. Yes, he's throwing, throwing fiery darts at us. And he's trying his best to tear us apart. But make no mistake, we've already won. When I think about standing firm, I see that giant oak tree. That oak tree has survived countless hurricanes. It has remained standing through the ravages of war. It has endured through oppressive heat and drought and massive floods. It stands firm because it is deeply rooted. The main root, it's called the tap root on an oak, goes as deeply into the ground as it is tall above the ground. Those trees stand firm because of their roots. I went home to see my mom and dad in New Orleans last week before I came here. My mom still lives in the house I grew up in. And when I got there, I was so sad because there was this big tree right in front of our house and it had to be cut down. And you know, when you cut down a big tree like that, like your yard, it's like it's naked. It's just awful. It was so bare. It was heartbreaking. But the tree had gotten infected with something, and it was dying from the inside out. I brought a picture of the, the stump so you could see this root. You can see the hole where the disease was just eating away through the middle of the trunk. But because it was inside the tree, you couldn't see it till it was too late. I haven't been able to get that trunk out of my mind. When we fall for the schemes of the enemy, when we believe those lies, we get infected. When we turn on each other, that infection spreads. And when we believe the lie that we've got to fight the way the world fights with violence and hate, root rot begins. The tree weakens. Don't believe the lie that we have to fight back. How did Jesus stand firm? When mocked and threatened, he didn't utter a word. He entrusted himself to the Father, and he willingly spread out his arms in the greatest act of sacrificial love the world has ever seen. Jesus never operated from fear. He wasn't afraid of opposition. He wasn't afraid of bad news. He wasn't afraid of death. He conquered it all through love. Are you operating from fear? Do you think that there is something in the world that will take down the kingdom of God? Then you have believed a lie. Jesus is strong enough. And his love is enough. Last year, uh, my stepmother, Harriet Lowell Stafford, died. She was married to my dad for 40 years. I was a little girl when she and my dad got married, and I was not happy about it. In my mind, she was the enemy, and she was the reason that my family was broken. My mom suffered from pretty severe depression, and I blame that on Harriet as well. And I remember not long after Dad and Harriet were married, Harriet gave my mom a present for Christmas. And I remember thinking that was so weird. As time went on, Harriet continued to give my mom gifts on different occasions, and she was always kind and open to my mom. 
She would invite my mom to come to things um, with her family that included my sisters and my dad. Year after year, she kept loving my mom through actions and words, and, and us. Um, she kept on and she kept on, even when we would dismiss her or not return that love. After many years, my mom started to say yes to these invitations, and she started to come to these gatherings. And so it would be my step family and my mom and my dad. Anyway, it seems strange to everyone. When my older sister was going through a really hard time in Knoxville, Tennessee, my mom and my stepmom got in a car and drove together to help my sister. It was weird. When uh, I was with my dad last week, he's, he told us that when he and Harriet decided to get married, Harriet said to my dad, Norm, you're a package deal. And that package includes your kids and your ex-wife. And we are now all one family. And she loved all of us from that moment on through it all. She loved my mom when my mom couldn't love her back. She loved my mom without any expectation of return. She loved my mom even though it seemed weird to everyone around her. And one night, Dad, Harriet, and my mom were all at a gathering together. And as usual, as they were leaving, everyone was hugging each other. And my mom whispered to Harriet as they hugged, I love you. Harriet loved because she was rooted in love. She knew that the only thing that can truly conquer discord and disunity is love. She loved in order that our family might be one. We stand firm in the strength of God when we are deeply rooted in the love of Jesus. We stand firm, allowing that love to flow up from our roots and out into the world. We stand firm, loving one another, for it was love that conquered our true enemy on the cross. So what can we do to promote this unity and peace in the body of Christ? I think we have to start living out some things that Paul has told us in this letter already. You've already heard these things, but I'm going to say them to you again. Because I don't know about you, but I think I could be working on these things for the rest of my life. Starting with chapter 4, verse 2. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Check yourself. Check your words. Check your actions. Check your social media presence. Be completely humble and gentle. Chapter 4, verse 15. Speak the truth in love. And verse 25, therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. We must be people who speak truthfully, but also live truthfully. Don't share or spread things that you aren't certain are true. And then 29 to 32, this is a high bar for our speech. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate 
to one another, forgiving one another, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Kara City, it starts right here with you. Stand together as one. Stand with other churches as one. Be committed to stand for what Jesus stood for. Healing, compassion, freedom, love. Stand firm. Will you pray with me?